Amen. Okay. Can everybody hear me okay? All right. I have a lot to say tonight. And frankly, I don't really need notes on this, uh, this topic, but it'll keep me on the rails a little bit, so I'm going to use notes anyway. The funny thing is, is when I was in the Philippines, I think the first year, we went to uh, preach to a bunch of, uh, a group of police officers in Manila, and I had prepared to speak for about 30 minutes, and uh, the police chief said, well, you can have these guys for like two hours if you want. So I just, we did what we were going to do, and then I turned to Romans 1 and preached through that f for them as well. Um, I, here, here's the thing on, on Romans 1 and what we're going to talk about today. My goal tonight is to explain this, because here, here's what I believe. Here's what I believe. I believe that a lot of people out there are very confused about this. When I say a lot of people out there, I mean a lot of unsaved, just normal people are very confused about what's happening in our society today. They, they're being told certain things, but it doesn't really match up to what, you know, that law in their heart tells them. And, you know, I work with normal people all the time. And they're not saved, but they're just normal, everyday, unsaved people. And they don't like what's going on, and they're confused about a lot of the things that are going on in our society today. But here's the thing. The Bible has the answer for everything. Amen. So what I want to do, and a, fun, a funny thing happened to me about three, four weeks ago, is I met, I was out soul winning in Sacramento, and I met a lady. And I was soul winning um, uh, with my partner, and we walked up to this porch with these three children on the porch, and I asked them if their mom was home so I could get permission to talk to these kids. They were from 12 to 14 years old. And it turned out that the mom came out, sat on the porch with all the kids, and this mom just had, it was one of the most fascinating conversations that I've had, and I'll remember it, I think, for the rest of my life. This woman did not get saved. And I knew after about three quarters of the way through the gospel that she was not going to get saved. But here's the thing, and we're going to teach you on Saturdays, if you come soul winning, and on Sundays, to not argue with people out soul winning. That we're not there to, you know, um, stand there and just debate people constantly back and forth. But if someone is willing to listen to the Word of God and they have legitimate questions, we ought to sit there and answer their questions. Because that is sowing seeds in their heart. And here we had a woman, I'm not going to talk about all her different questions, but she had a, this was a woman who had a hard time believing in God because of certain things that she ha is seeing in the world today. And her main thing that she was concerned about was that um, there was a, a, a convicted child molester who had been in prison and he was being released and put into her neighborhood, wherever that was. And she just kept bringing up to me, even during the gospel presentation, um, how, could, how could there be a God that would allow people like this to exist and would create people like this? And so I went and I explained, I answered all of her questions and I, I want to use Mary um, I've changed her name for the, for the sermon tonight, but I want to use Mary in the conversation, parts of the conversation I had with Mary as I go through um, Romans 1, the last half of Romans 1. I, wanna, I, want you to, I want you to understand the kinds of questions and the kinds of confusion that normal people have. And I also want you to understand that the Bible has all of the answers for those questions. Okay? Now, last week, we started off and we talked about um, Romans 1, we did the first half, or a little bit more than half. We talked about how everybody starts with two things. Every person on this planet is, is born into the same creation, the things of God that we can all see, and also the law is written in everyone's heart. That's what they're born with. They're given that at the starting line. So what we're going to see as we move forward, I, wanna, I want to go through Romans 1 starting in chapter or in verse number 21 and just and explain to you a process that is happening to someone and that can happen to someone that does happen to people okay so if we um, we all start with the same two things the starting line is the same in Romans um, chapter 1 and verse 21 the Bible reads because that when they knew God they glorified him not as God neither were thankful become vain in their imaginations and if you can if you don't mind writing in your Bible I'm going to give you several words to underline in Romans 1 and vain would be one of them became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened 
than, of course, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. We talked about this last week. These people first became prideful. And if you read the Bible and you know about pride, pride is the entrance gate to many different sins, okay, to many different sins in your life. So these people first became vain and they became prideful. And then if we start in verse 23, this will be the, the first verse of this next sermon, the Bible reads, it continues on and tells you what else happened. And, they ch and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man, and to birds, and to four-footed beasts, and creeping things. So they started taking away the glory from God. And they started taking away God's glory and giving it to idols, to things that were not God. Okay? Then in verse 24, we read, Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. The word wherefore means because of. In verse 24, it says, you know, it basically is saying, because of this, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts. Continue in verse 25, the Bible says, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. They changed God's word. They lied about God's word. They, they're, they're, they're saying something that they're putting words in God's mouth or they're taking words out of God's mouth, and then they refuse to worship God. They worship and serve the creature more than the creator. And then in verse 26, we see again, the same as wherefore. He says again, whenever the Bible really wants to get something across to you, they will say it, you know, the, the Word of God will say it twice. We're going we're gonna to hear it say, said more than twice here. And it says, for this cause, God gave them up. Again, God gave them up unto vile affections. Vile meaning repulsive, um, disgusting, things that a normal person would look at and think is, is, is horrid or horrible. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And the Bible continues in verse number 27. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust towards one another, men with men, working in that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense. Recompense meaning payment or compensation for something bad that you've done. That recompense of their error which was meat. Now, Mary who I, I talked to at the doorstep, kept asking me how, why these people could even exist if there's a God. If there's a good God, why could people like this guy that's coming into her neighborhood even exist? So I turned to, I had already given her the gospel. Um, she, we had already talked about Bible versions and all these different things because she doubted the Word of God as well, the sidetrack here, but she doubted the Word of God because there's so many different Bible versions. How do you know which one is true? You see, it's brilliant because you don't really have to get anyone to believe the false version. All you have to do is throw out 150 versions out there and everyone's like, oh, which one's real? You just have to create doubt. Because in order to get saved, you have to believe the Word of God, right? Now, I started reading, I read Mary what I just read you. And Mary said to me, well, that's talking about homosexuals. That's what she said to me. And I said, well, yeah, I didn't even mention the word homosexual to her. She said, that's talking about homosexuals. And she said, well, they're born that way. And I said, well, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that it's a cause and effect. It's a cause and effect. Everybody here who went, even I went to public school, we did cause and effect, right? We read a paragraph. What was the cause? You know, Bob couldn't get out of bed in the morning, so he lost his job. The cause was Bob couldn't get out of bed. The effect is he lost his job. So what happened is these people, basically, they did these four. They became prideful. They took away glory from God. They changed God's word. They refused to worship God. And God gave them up. God gave them up. It's a cause and effect. And then if we read Romans 28, Romans 1, 28, they see, God says it again. And even as they did not... So it was, wherefore, for this cause, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, they wanted to just forget about God, just completely turn on God. God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. You see, Mary, God didn't shoot, didn't fire the first shot here. 
These people completely turned on God. They changed his word. They, they lied about him. They worshiped the creature more than the creator. And he gave them up. He turned his back on them. They turned on him. He turned on them. That, that's how it went. But they first turned on him. Okay? God commendeth his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God doesn't want anyone to go to hell. But if you turn on God, the Bible here is saying that if it gets bad enough, he will give you over and he will turn on you. Now, this idea of God rejecting people, you say, you know, I don't believe you. Turn to Matthew 13. Reprobate. What does reprobate mean? Jeremiah, while well, you turn there, Jeremiah 6.30 says, Reprobate silver shall men call them, because the Lord hath rejected them. That first of all tells me that the word reprobate means rejected. And second of all, it tells me that God rejects certain people. Yeah. It happens. The biggest example and clearest example I can see of this in the Bible is Pharaoh. And you don't have to turn there. I'm just going to read you a few different things from Exodus 7. But you remember when Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and they, gave the, they, they started the ten plagues against Pharaoh to try to get him to release the children of, of Israel. The first plague was water to blood. You know, the rivers turned to blood. And Pharaoh, the Bible says it this way, and Pharaoh's heart grew hard and he did not heed them. So he hardened his heart. The second plague was frogs and the Bible quotes it this way. But when Pharaoh saw that there was relief, he hardened his heart. The third plague was lice, and the Bible quotes it this way, Pharaoh's heart grew hard. The fourth plague was flies, and the Bible quotes it this way, but Pharaoh hardened his heart at this time also. By the time we get to the sixth plague of boils, we start to see this phrase, but the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh. The Lord hardened his heart. In the eighth plague, we see that same statement again. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart. He hardened his heart. He hardened his heart. He hardened his heart. And finally, God's like, you're done. I hardened your heart. Now I'm going to make an example of you, and I'm going to destroy you in front of the, the whole nation of Egypt. I'm going to destroy the whole nation of Egypt. In Matthew 13, we see how Jesus, Jesus rejected the Pharisees. And in Matthew 13, in verse number 10, we're going to read through to verse 15. Just so we can get the full context, this is Jesus. We need to understand who Jesus really is, if we want to understand the Bible. In Matthew 13, starting in verse 10, the Bible says, And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered and said to them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. Why? Why is it not given to them? That's my question. For whosoever hath to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. And whosoever that hath not from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Esaias, which saith, By hearing they shall hear, and not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, that's waxed hard towards the Lord, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. Lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. He's basically saying, I've blinded them because I've already given up on them, they've rejected me, I've rejected them, and the reason I'm speaking to you in parables is because I don't want them to get saved. They're done. That's what he said. That's Jesus. That's Jesus. And the prophet prophecy of Isaiah is in Isaiah 6, 8. We can see that in the Old Testament. Just so you know that God is the same in the Old Testament and the New Testament. I am the Lord. I change not. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I. Send me. And he said, Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Sound familiar? Make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, 
and understand with their heart and convert and be healed. He's like, I don't even, I don't want them to be healed. He's like, at this point, shut their eyes. Make their heart fat. Make them happy. So when I, I, I just am going to come and destroy them, is what he says. In verse 11, then said I, Lord, how long? How long are you going to shut their eyes? And he answered, until the cities be wasted without inhabitant, and the houses without man, and the land be utterly desolate. God rejects people. He has consistently rejected people in the Bible. This is not new. Just think, I mean, just think about it. Think of the, the people in the promised land. When the children of Israel crossed the, uh, the Jordan River into the promised land, they were to destroy everyone. Those people in Jericho, those people in all those different nations, they were done. They had worshipped other gods. They had turned their back on God. They had sacrificed children. They had done all these horrible things. God was done with them. Just wipe them all out. That's what he said. And that's what they were to do. So, who, who are these people? Who are these people? I want you to go back to verse number 26. Verse number 26. I, want you to, I just first wanted you to understand that this idea that God can reject someone and that God doesn't just love everyone no matter what forever, it, it's not in the Bible. It's not taught in the Bible. I want to go back to verse number 26 and I want to look at a, few, a couple different things. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise, I want you to under, underline the word natural there, and then underline the word against nature. You could basically say that means unnatural, right? That's right. And likewise also the men leaving the natural, underline that, use of the woman burned in their lust toward one another. Men with men working, working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense, payment, of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind, rejected mind. We just looked at that. To do those things which are not convenient, meaning not natural. Not convenient. Being filled with unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetous, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection. Underline natural again. So Mary asked me at this point, she said, well, I have a friend who's a lesbian, she said. And so I read her verses 29 through 31, and I said to, um, I said to Mary, I said, do these sound like nice people? And she said, no. And she was kind of past, I mean, she was listening to me, which is why I spent the time to talk to her. And she was past the idea that the, the, they were born this way. And I, I showed her what the Bible said, that they became this way because of what they did towards God, and that God had given them up. And I told Mary, I said, do these sound like nice people? And she said, no. And I told Mary, we're, I'm sitting with Mary and her three kids, two kids and a, I think a friend of her kids, and I said, you keep your friend away from these kids. Yeah. And you know what that unsaved lady did? That unsaved, normal lady, she didn't say a word for about five to ten seconds. She was thinking about what I said, and then you know what she said? She said, yeah. She said, you're right. You know why? Because she knows that that friend of hers is into things that she shouldn't be into. And she knows that as soon as I cut through the garbage on TV that she's been taught and whatever pop culture is telling her today, she knows that what I was reading her was true. That's right, man. And she said to me, she said, you're right. You're right. And I told her, you, and if that's all, look, if that's all my conversation with Mary got across is that Mary stops hanging out with people like that, and keeps people like that away from her kids, amen. Even if Mary, I, I pray that Mary gets saved one day. But Mary kept bringing up this guy, okay? This guy is going to get put in her neighborhood. And I asked Mary, before I moved on, 
Before I moved on, I said, Mary, what do you think should happen to that guy? And she said, well, he should be executed. Right. And so I kept reading for Mary. And I said, well, Mary, read, well, let's look at verse number 32. And I read, knowing, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. That's a hard saying, but that's what the Bible says. The Bible is very clear on this. And a lot of people don't want to say this today. Turn to Leviticus 20. We're going to read it together. I mean, this is not a trivial subject in the Bible. Leviticus chapter 20. Go to verse number 13. Leviticus chapter 20 and verse number 13. The Bible reads, If a man also lie with mankind, as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination, they shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. You see, Mary, it's not God's fault that in the United States of America we don't follow his rules. That is the answer of why they're putting that person in your neighborhood. That's the answer. Is because we're just, we're not following God's rules here. And for that reason, there's a lot of people in danger. That, it's, it's that simple, Mary. And she got it, clear as day, just like that. Now, you say, oh, well, that guy was a child molester, you know, not a, a homosexual. And, you know, you can't equate the two. Well, yeah, I can. Remember how I had you under, underline natural and unnatural? It's all the same, folks. It's all the same thing. I took a training class. I took a training class at my, my last job that I, I quit before I came here. It was about a month ago. I took a training class. It was, uh, it was anti-harassment or whatever. And, that, and that's fine. I don't, I don't harass anybody. I don't want to harass anybody. But um, this lady, they brought in a consultant, and this lady taught us that there is now, and this is, uh, we'll talk about this in the public school sermon coming up in a few weeks, but they're learning this in public school as well. And you probably didn't all know this, but there is now officially 102 different, uh, I don't even know what you call them, uh, identifications or identities or whatever you want to call them, um, gender preferences or, or whatever. It's all unnatural, folks. It's all stuff where like, and you know what the funny thing is? I'm sitting in this group, this room of 15 guys, you know, hardworking guys that get up every morning and go and support their families all unsaved, right? And the, the, the most worldly guy in the room, we're all just sitting there like, oh, can we just get through this class and be done with this? The most worldly guy in the room raises his hand and he's like, whatever happened to a man and a woman? <laughs> he says. The most worldly guy that, that I worked with. I mean, he gets it, right? Because she said next year there's probably going to be 150. And my kids teach me all the time about what all the different ones mean. I was going to look them up and read a couple to you, but, you know, you got to draw the line somewhere with, with this stuff. And it's, it's, it's sick and it's disgusting, and I don't want to be on the places that, that list that thing, and I don't want these kids to even hear these words. Okay? But here's the thing. That lady was right. There's 102 or 150 or 200. She was just missing two categories, and one is natural, and it's man and woman, and just put all the other ones in the unnatural. It's all the same thing. Because once you've been given over, you have the capability to do anything that's unnatural like that. It's all the same thing. Now it makes perfect sense. Are you confused now? No. It's natural and unnatural. That's it. I, I don't care how many you, you claim to be. Go to Leviticus 18. You're in Leviticus 20. Turn back to Leviticus, Leviticus 18. And look at verse number 23. It's all the same thing, folks. It's, it's unnatural things. These are not things that normal people struggle with or have the desire for. They've been given over to it. In Leviticus 18, 23, the Bible reads, Neither shall thou lie with any beast to defile thyself with therewith, neither shall any woman stand before a beast to lie down thereto. It is confusion meaning perversion. It's all the same thing, natural or unnatural. 
Okay, it, it, that, that just clears it all up. And I, I explained that to Mary as well. Now Mary, well, let me, th that's why it doesn't matter how weird it gets. Because we will still understand what's happening. Okay, it's, it's whatever weirdness they want. But we need to take action to protect, you know, our families and to protect, you know, the, this church. So now I want to I give you some application on now that we understand this, what does it mean? What does it mean for us? What does it mean for us? Ours is a spiritual battle. I am not going to start a political action committee to change the government. Okay, ours is a spiritual battle. And what, so what is our action plan? What, what does it mean for us? The first thing I want to give you is uh, what it means for the unsaved people out there. What is Romans 1 telling to the unsaved? So here's the application part of the sermon, okay? What it's giving is to everyone, both the saved and the unsaved, is it's a warning. It's a warning. And to the unsaved, it's like, you know what? You never know when it might be too late. You never know. Personally, if you're not saved, you just, you just never know. You know, you're going to get older. You're, gonna, you, you're not guaranteed another breath. I'm not guaranteed another breath. None of us are. You know, just it, it's, it should be a wake-up call that you never know when it might be too late. But the one thing that I want to bring up in honor of Mary tonight is I could tell with Mary that this was a very personal situation for her. And I didn't ask her any questions or anything like that. But here's what I want to, here's what I want to explain and what I explained to Mary. Okay? And this is why it is so important that we, that we learn and understand the God of the Bible. Okay, because Mary would not have been the way she was and had the questions that she had about God if she understood who God was. Okay? Now, Mary, what I want to say in honor of her is that if you or someone that you know have been hurt by people like this, this, is, you know, don't turn on God. Don't turn on God. Well, that's easy to say, right? Well, let me introduce you to somebody. Okay, turn to Luke chapter 17. This is the first thing I told Mary. Luke chapter 17. In Luke chapter 17, we hear Jesus talking. And in verse number 1, the Bible says, Then he said unto his disciples, It is impossible but that offenses will come. But woe unto him through whom they come. Offenses meaning, you know, someone committing a, a criminal offense. That's the, the context of this. And then Jesus says, It would be better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he cast into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. C cause an offense or commit an offense against the child is what Jesus is saying. Jesus was very, and God is very protective of children in the Old Testament, and Jesus was the same way in the New Testament. Now you say, oh, but Jesus is this guy who's always carrying a sheep and a cane around all the time. That's the, the pictures of Jesus I grew up with, this long-haired guy with it. I'm like, why is he always carrying a sheep? What, what sense does that even make? You know, he's carrying a sheep. Every church I go into, he's got a sheep and his, a lamb. He's carrying it around all the time. I never hear that once in the Bible. I'm like, what in the world? But let me explain to you who Jesus is, okay? Go to Isaiah. I want you to go to Isaiah 59, and I'm going to read for you Ephesians 6, um, 13 through 17. Ephesians 6, 13 through 17 is the whole armor of God, all right? The Bible is telling us, and I, I, first I have to uh, disclose that this particular comment was noticed by Garrett in a Bible study of ours at home, so I want to give him intellectual credit for this, for noticing this, this correlation in the Bible. I'm like, listen, I'm preaching Romans 1, you got to let me use it. That's, or, or you have to move out. That's it. <laughs> but no, it's, it's, it's very good. I want you to see this. In, in Ephesians 6, 13 through 17, you're going to go to um, Isaiah 59, okay? In Ephesians 6, it's talking about the whole armor of God. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. God's telling us what to prepare ourselves with. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, above all taking the shield of faith, 
Whether all you be able to quench the fight, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And then take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Okay? That's our weapons. That's our armor. That's our weapons. Now look at what Jesus is wearing. In Isaiah chapter 59, the Bible says, For he put on righteousness as a breastplate. He's still got the righteousness of a, uh, in the breastplate. Righteousness as a breastplate. And the helmet of salvation. He still has the helmet. He has no shield. Probably doesn't need one. And he put on the garments. He has garments that I don't have. Right? He put on the garments of vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as a cloak. So he's got these garments. He's got this clothing that I don't have. Right? Go to Revelation chapter 19. It gets even better. And I, showed, I did show this to Mary. In Revelation chapter 19. So we don't have these garments of vengeance, but Jesus has them. And look at what they look like. In Revelation 19, and starting in verse number 12, you know, let's just get a description of Jesus. Uh, you know, it doesn't sound like he's holding a sheep to me. His eyes were as flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture, a garment, dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. He's wearing garments of vengeance, and they're dripping with blood after he's poured out his wrath and his vengeance. You know, the Bible says in Romans 12, 19, I'll just read it for you. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. The Lord, I told Mary that the Lord will repay with a perfect vengeance and a complete vengeance. These people, like that guy moving into her neighborhood or whoever she was thinking about when she was talking to me, are going to burn in the lowest parts of hell. And God is going to take care of this situation much more complete and better than we ever could even think of. So we don't have to, so Mary or anybody, you don't have to carry that. You don't have to carry that. It's unfortunate that these people exist and that they are able to hurt people, but you don't have to carry that because God will take care of it. Do not turn on God. It is not His fault that we don't follow the rules. He will clean up the mess and He will clean it up completely. We just have to be patient and we have to have faith in that. Okay? All right. Next. To the saved. To us. What does that mean for us? You know, these people are out there. They're probably out there right now. Um, these people are out there, out there, these unnatural haters of God. So our action plan is this. It's predator control. That's our action plan. Okay? So predator control, you know, it has, it has, it has two, two parts to it. First of all, good fences. We will guard this church, and we will not bring them all in. You know, we will not bring homos into this church. We will not bring whatever other things are out there into this church. Anything unnatural is not coming into this church. And we will guard that. I will guard that with my life. I, I, will, I will not be part of putting anybody, any, anybody's children, anybody's wife in this church in danger. And the men of this church and myself, we, we, will, we will hold that line. And, and this is, we will, hold this, we will hold this doctrinal line as well. All right? I will, not, I will not tolerate, and I know the pastor of this church will not tolerate sympathizers of these types of people. Amen. And that, that's enough for us. If you, you have questions or whatever, that's different. But if you're going to be pushing to your, you know, bring these types of people into this church, you are in the wrong church. Period. So we will hold that line. And, you know, you want to talk about the family integrated church? This is part of it. You know, I tell my kids all the time, if you leave the cat food out, you, the skunks are going to keep coming. 
So you don't create an environment where these people can have access to children. That's one of the reasons we're a family integrated church. I encourage you, as, as a culture in this church, and as a, especially as a culture in your home, to keep an eye on your kids. We do not send our kids to, it is my job to protect my kids. You know, people have called me a helicopter parent before. Hey, I'm a quadcopter parent. Amen. I'm not messing around with this. It's my job, and I take it extremely seriously. So we will not create an environment here. Watch your kids. I, we, don't, we don't do sleepovers at people's house. There's a very short list of, you know, like my parents and my wife's parents. And, you know, honestly, we, we just kind of watch our kids all the time. You know, we, we don't really, we don't send our kids off to be taken care of by somebody else. And, you know, it's a reason to homeschool, not put your kid in daycare. It ties into everything that we talked about um, last week. You know, if it, we moved here, and I haven't gone to this website in, in, since we moved here, but go to familywatchdog.us. Write it down. Go to familywatchdog.us and type in your address of your house. And then, and then have a nice day. <laughs> because it's bad. It'll show you all the sex offenders, the registered sex offenders in your neighborhood. And it's like, pfft, they're everywhere. And it's not, you can actually click on the little dots and you can see a picture of the person and you can see what they did. And it's all, I mean, it's not all, but I mean, the vast majority is old men who have hurt children, yep. period. Yeah. And they're being put in these neighborhoods and you know, that's why Mary's upset. She should be upset. And when you go to this website, you're gonna be upset. Unless you live out in the country in the middle of nowhere, and maybe you, you'll still be surprised. Who knows? Every time I go there to check, I'm surprised. And you just have to make the decision that, I, well, I guess it's two blocks away. Because there, there's nowhere else to go where you're not. It's crazy that we deal with this stuff here. And the children, I mean, you know, when we talk about the Catholic Church and, and the Boy Scouts of America, when, they, when the Boy Scouts of America made the decision to let homosexual men be scout leaders 10 years ago, I told my wife, I was like, what in the world? I'm like, You're, we're just going to just wait 10 years and look what's happening. They're saying the Boy Scout situation is worse than the Catholic Church now. It's crazy. I mean, who's thinking about these kids? I mean, you hear about the Catholics, they just cover it all up and all this garbage. What about the kids? Right. Don't their parents even care? It, it's, it's crazy. It's, it's unfathomable. It's, it's nuts. So anyway, let, let me just close here. I mean, this idea, guys and gals, that God loves everyone is false. It's not even logical. It, it doesn't make any sense. Remember when Jehu said to Jehoshaphat, Sunday morning, thou, shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Hello? You turn to Psalm 139. Psalm 139. Let me just stereotype everyone in the entire world here in the next three minutes. <laughs> Psalm 139, look at verse uh, 21 and 22. So Jehu said, shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? And then in Psalm 139, the psalmist says, do I not hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? And am I not grieved with those that rise up against thee? I hate them with a perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies. If you think that you can love these wicked, unnatural people and also love children at the same time, you're a liar. You're a liar. You know, if you're a farmer... And, and you love uh, coyotes as much as you love your, your lambs. You're, you're, you're an idiot. You, you don't love your lambs then. You know, if you love weeds and you also love wheat, and the bank comes around and they're taking your farm away because you can't grow a crop, and you're like, well, I just can't get myself to pull these weeds. It, it's, it, it doesn't make any sense. It's illogical. The Bible is a logical book. If you come to situations where, the, where you're like, this is not logical, guess who gave you your logic? God. He wrote it in your heart. That's why we talked about the law written in your heart in the very first sermon in this series. 
Now, let me characterize everybody in the whole world. So we have the saved and the unsaved, right? So the unsaved is like, I don't know, one, you know, 99, 98% of the entire world. And then amongst the unsaved, we have three categories of people. We have the, hate, the, the enemies of God, we have our personal enemies, and then we have um, our neighbor, right? So you all are my brothers and sisters. You're saved. But amongst the unsaved, you have your neighbor, you have your enemies, and hopefully that list is small, but maybe a lot of people have a lot of personal enemies. And I guess your enemies could actually be your, your brother and sister too. Hopefully not. The Bible preaches against that. But you have these three categories of unsaved people. The only people that we are supposed to hate are the enemies of God. So I want to point out that, you know, don't be this guy who's got this holster with two reprobate label makers in his pocket and he's just walking around and give the gospel to somebody one time and you're like, reprobate! You know, don't be that guy. Because what, what God is trying to do here in Romans 1 for us is he's trying to warn us. He's trying to show us. When you see these unnatural signs of these sick, twisted people, warning! They're, they're reprobates. Don't bring them in your church. Keep, keep them away from you. You know, well, he told us what we're supposed to do, but we're not doing that, but at least we can have that as a warning. Okay? We're even supposed to love our enemies. Okay? And so we just need to be careful with the reprobate label maker is all I want to just say as a side note before we end here. In 1 John 2, and the reason that I personally want to be careful with the reprobate label maker, and I'm not talking about unnatural people. I'm talking about you know, somebody that I don't like, or somebody that didn't accept the gospel after I gave it to him the sixth time. That's, that's not to be reprobate, right? In 1 John 2, 11, the Bible says, But he that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whether he goeth, because that darkness hath blinded his, his eyes. So if I get really, really mad at you, and I decide personally that, you know, because our emotions can take over sometimes, and I decide personally that you were never saved, and you're a reprobate, and I, I'm wrong, you know, that has some consequences on myself. So, you know, the God, Bible says that, you know, God will blind my eyes. I'll be in darkness. You know, I, I don't want to go there. So use Romans 1 the way it's supposed to be used for us. And that says a warning on, on that these people are out there, how they got to be that way. It's not God's fault. This is why there's evil people in the world. This is why, Mary, these people exist. It's because they turned on God and God turned on them. Now, you know, why don't you hear this more? You don't hear it more because pastors today are either cowards or liars or both. That's, right. That's it. And I don't even know what else to say. It's, it's right there in the Bible. It's not, it, this isn't like confusing prophecy where we got to go to the book of Ezekiel and, and try to figure out what it might be and all this. It's like right there. It's just right in your face. And God would not make something like this confusing. He would not make something like this confusing. It makes perfect sense that God would not want these people in his church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against his church. What sense would it make if he would wanted us to bring in a bunch of people that were going to hurt people in this church? It's not going to happen, folks. Not here. Okay? Now look, this is an age-old philosophical debate, this whole thing. And... I remember, I want to just close with this. I, I read a book several years ago. It was on the Civil War. And in this book, there was this colonel, and he was having a conversation with, uh, with, a, with this old, gruff sergeant. And the colonel was an idealist, and he was, a, he was a, someone who, who wanted to see the good in everybody. And the, and the conversation was this. The colonel was saying to the old man, he was saying, I believe there's a divine spark. You know, that's obviously not a biblical term, but he said, I believe that there's a divine spark in man. And the old colonel said, no. He said, no, colonel. He said, you're a lovely man for thinking that. You're an idealist. He said, but there's no divine spark, colonel. He said, I've seen men do things to each other that tell me and show me, show me that there's many a man alive with no more value than a dead dog. And you know the funny thing about that debate between those two men? I wish I could have been here with the Bible right between them because guess what? They're both right. The divine spark is your conscience. 
that divine spark that that colonel was seeing was that was the law written in every man's heart some guy that just grew up in the middle of nowhere and didn't didn't know the bible but there was there was he was trying to do right and trying to do the good things and this is what the colonel saw but then the the old irish sergeant had seen men in in ireland in his homeland murdering each other and doing wicked horrible things to each other they're both right both of those types of people exist. It just happened that the sergeant misinterpreted what he saw. These people exist, folks. But there is, I do believe, that most people are disgusted by this. And I do believe that the Bible provides the answer for them. When I walked away from Mary, she got it. She got it. She's thinking about it. I pray that she goes to church and learns more and somebody can give her the gospel again after she's let some of these things soak in because you know what she was pretty twisted up on a lot of things and sometimes you might have to give the gospel to somebody a few times you know I know I know husbands and wives who have had an unsaved spouse for over 10 years and one day the spouse just gets it and gets saved I personally know people like that so let's not give up on people, but let's also not be, we, we must be aware of what's out here, and we must recognize it. And the way we can recognize it is when you see these unnatural signs and these unnatural things. And that's when we, put the, we, we draw the line. We draw the line here. And we'll always have that line here. Okay? Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for um, your word. Lord, we thank you for just the, how much sense the Bible makes, Lord. We, we thank you for, you know, all the, all the wisdom and, and just, just, you're not the author of confusion and you just, your word just clarifies everything for you. All we have to do is, is know it and, and read it and learn it and believe it and teach it to others, Lord. Lord, we thank you for this church. Uh, continue to bless this ministry. Bless these people, Lord. Um, keep us all safe, Lord, in a, in a wicked world. And we pray all this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen.